When I was 11 years old in the seventh grade, I actually saw my father shoot a man in the head in self-defense. Uh, just a lot of drama broke out at our house. I, I should have been in the back room uh, with my five brothers and sisters, but I was nosy. So I came to the front door and saw a young man point a pistol down actually towards me. And so my father responded in self-defense. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't fatal, and we were all sequestered in the house for safety purposes, but my parents always stressed education. And so my mother figured out a way for me to get to school. So a uniformed police officer took me to school. I wasn't embarrassed by it. I wasn't ashamed by it. I was so glad that I could go to school because the classroom was a place where I could just hide, feel free, be safe. My parents stressed education, taught me that education was my ticket out of poverty, and that if I got something up here, nobody could take it away from me. My parents divorced when I was 15 years old. It was a violent divorce. Uh, we had to flee our house that summer. We came back. Hardly anything was there. He left a mattress for, for my si younger sister and I to sleep on. And he told us that summer that we, would, we wouldn't be anything without him. Uh, to quote him, unfortunately, he said we'd be hookers on the street without him. And I said then, uh, I told my sister, she was devastated by it. We were all devastated. And my mom said at 15 years old, I responded, I said, no, we're going to be the first in our family to go to college. Um, we're going to get our mother out of these housing projects. My mother was a hard worker, so she could get herself out of the housing projects. But we wanted to be a part of that. And that I was going to be the president of something one day. I got a full scholarship to the college of my choice and went to Berkeley, got a great college education, and then came to work for this company. My job actually at one point was a central office equipment engineer. My job was to remove all the old switching machines out of the big buildings so we could put the small switches in. I ended up being the president of AT&T North Carolina. My mother always said none of her girls would make their money on the street and I was blessed to accompany John Stevens a couple years ago when we celebrated our, I think it was our 30th anniversary on Wall Street. I looked up and I said, oh my goodness. I mean, I, I literally started crying. I started crying. I said, oh my goodness, I am making my money on the street, Wall Street. So I have been blessed, very happily married for over 30 years. Uh, we spent the first 10 years of our marriage trying to have kids. I had four second trimester miscarriages and then a daughter who was born, born four months four months premature, and so she died at six and a half months old. Everything the doctor said would kill her did not, um, and so she ended up dying from something called chylothorax, and so we actually ended up finding the cure for her little condition four months into her life, uh, but really the surgery needed to be done the first two months. So the good news is, at Children's Hospital Oakland, they do this little surgery, and so for a while there, they were calling it the Carolyn Marshall surgery. Uh, her doctors spoke at her funeral, and said, Carolyn Marshall was here to teach us that we're not God, that there are things we don't know about, and so we need to continue our research. So she was here for a reason. Uh, I can talk about it uh, in a beautiful way, because truly she was here for a reason, to teach a lot of people a lot of lessons. And so because of her, because of her passing away, I was grieving, we ended up going to an adoption meeting, I didn't want to be there, and we learned about a little boy who they had just made a decision about to put him in a group home at two and a half years old. So it was just divine orchestration how we ended up uh, with a little boy who had been abandoned when he was nine months old. And I came home late one night and they had been watching TV, flipping the channels, and saw this little girl on this news story. And so my son told my husband that he had to call that 100 kind of number, an 800 number, because the little girl looked sad and she needed a big brother, nothing about a mother or father. He said she needed a big brother and she needed to be happy and so he was going to adopt her the way we had adopted him. Every night my son would say, Mommy, we have to pray for the little girl on TV. I have to adopt her. I think they said it was about 800 people who called the TV station. We got her. She is my 20 year old. So that's my baby with the first lady right there who plays soccer in college. Um, and then when we moved to North Carolina, my son was watching something about foster care and how many kids are in foster care. And make a long story short, a few years ago, we adopted Alicia, who's 17 now, who is 12. So when we took my son to college, first thing I told him, I said, give me the remote control. <laughs> no more picking your sisters off the television. My husband ended up uh, getting brain damage, and they told us he would never walk or talk again. 
and this is when my son, we had just adopted Anthony, so we didn't have Shirley yet, and he brought home a virus from daycare. We all were on antibiotics and all that, but my husband was allergic to the antibiotics. They took him off the antibiotics, and during the time they took him off, before they could put him on another one, the virus went to his brain. So he ended up with viral encephalitis. They told us he'd never walk or talk again. One day, I called, and they couldn't find my husband. They said, we don't know where he is. Do you know where he is? And I was in South Carolina. I said, I'm a couple thousand miles away from there. You guys need to find my husband. He said he got up that morning, and something just said, get up. Went home and got my husband. And he's walking and talking. The, the doctor said he's about 90% back to normal. I said, that's less brain damage he had when I married him. <laughs> it's all right. My doctor called me the day before New Year's Eve, December 30th, 2010, and he says, I apologize, it's taking me so long to call you back. I, I know I told you you didn't have to worry about the pathology report. He said, I'm glad you didn't let me wait. He said, I hope you're sitting down. He said, I have some news. It's bad and it's significant. I'll never forget those words. It's bad and it's significant. He said, you have uh, colon cancer. He said, and it's stage three. He said, in fact, it's one lymph node away from stage four. He said, it's in your lymph nodes and your blood vessels. It's pretty bad. I would take my pump. I had a chemo pump. I named him Winston. Have you ever seen the movie when Stella got a groove back? Yes. And her boyfriend, young boyfriend, named it Winston. So I named my chemo pump Winston. I said, okay, th this thing's got to give me my groove back, okay? So uh, all the medicine that was going into me, so I'd go into the, the you know, infusion suite. I named that the clubhouse. I'm gonna write a book one day called Winston in the Clubhouse. So in fact, that's the name of my journal, Winston in the Clubhouse. So I'd go in the clubhouse, I'd go in that infusion suite, and my doctor said he never saw me come in there without having a party. Every month I threw a party in there. St. Patrick's Day, Valentine's Day, Flag Day, whatever, I, Easter, I would decorate it on Friday, I don't care how sick I was. And some days, my routine, pretty much I would have nine bad days and five good days. And on those five good days, I would do whatever I could. But even on the nine bad days, I would try to do some things. Usually three or four days right after chemo, I would just wiped out. It was brutal. I mean, I really thought I was in somebody else's body. But we parted in there like you wouldn't believe. And I would tell them, you know what? We are alive. We may not be well, but we are alive. And we gotta live every day. I mean, we gotta fight every day. Truly, this is the fight of our lives. I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. So the last email I wrote was one that my boss could send out to all my colleagues that basically you know, told them I had colon cancer and I, and I told them I was uniquely qualified for this because I had been through a lot in my life. I knew the Lord. I had them. I had family. I was uniquely qualified to get through this. And by the end of summer, I would not have cancer. And by the end of the summer, I did not have cancer. Good things always come out of bad things. Always. I have a like 10 lessons that I've learned in life that I talk about when I go out and speak. And one of them is sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is a train. Bad things do happen to good people. But you have to accept adversity and never get up, give up. Keep the right perspective and keep it moving. Sometimes it's not about what happens, it's how you respond to what happens. This transformation thing is awesome. I always tell this story about this prince and all that and how he was born with his back arched and his face looking down and then he had a statue painted and said, okay, I'm gonna have a straight back. Now, if you are born with a spinal deformity, do you honestly think you can transform yourself to having a straight back? Well, he got the statue carved by this great sculptor. He got help from his friends. He looked at it, the statue every day, he put it right in front of him so the, the vision, the new picture of himself could be right in front of him. He worked at it every day, and before you know it, the people in the king, kingdom noticed the change in the prince. He was walking a little taller, a little straighter. I always start off with that story because it's such a vivid picture of a transformation is real. Back arch, all of a sudden, you're standing up, and so you know why the transformation was successful? He had a vision, okay? He knew exactly what he wanted to look like. He got a help from somebody. The sculptor helped him. He worked hard, he worked at it daily. I mean, he put that statue in his private garden where only he could see it and focused on it. So focus is another piece. So 2020 is a part of our dream, okay? We gotta focus on it and it's personal. 
And so I tell all the employees, you need an individual development plan, IDP. You need one too. Where you literally, you look at your strengths, because we all, we all bring something to this party. I mean, we're very strong players, all 249,000 of us. So what are your strengths, okay? What area, so you can leverage those strengths. What areas do you want to improve on based on where you know the business is headed? And where do you want to go in this business? Like, what's your game plan? What are some of your goals? Do you want to be an expert in the field that you're in? Okay, well, is that even going to exist? Okay, so are you helping with the transition? Or do you need to start your transformation because, you know, you're going to be here for a while and you want to be in a new part of the business? There will be some parts of the business, legacy business, that will still exist. But the jobs will look very different. We are fastly becoming an IP company. We are becoming a software company. I came in this company where, I mean, one, my job actually at one point was a central office equipment engineer. My job was to remove all the old switching machines out of the big buildings so we could put the small switches in. So I saw that transformation. I've probably seen four or five transformations. But even in that job, every now and then you'd go in and one of those old switching machines, you'd hear something going, so, so we can't do it for you. I mean, it really is an individual development plan. Our commitment as a business is we will help you get there. Your supervisor will work with you. We'll give you the training that you need, whether it be technical and leadership training, because we're, we're all leaders, even if we're not in supervisory jobs. So that's what T University is all about. Our leadership development programs that we have in place. We have everything you need in this company to be successful. We can help you transform and get to 2020. I feel like these are 249,000 of my brothers and sisters. It's the family. It's the whole family. And so the, in order for the family to be healthy, everybody's got to be in there doing what they got to do. It's just like a regular family. You can't have like people just sitting around waiting for other family members to do things. And we're going to make it all available to you. Do it. Just do it. <laughs>